Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer and I'm from Cambridge University Press. Welcome to our lockdown series, lecture series, where Cambridge University Press authors will answer questions about their book and provide tips on remote teaching. Today's webinar will feature Jose Bermudez, who will speak about cognitive science, the third edition. If anyone has questions, please feel free to post them on the comment section and I will read them out loud. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much, Jennifer. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for thanks for organizing this this event. It's a it's a real pleasure to to share share some some of my experiences about teaching and also talk a little bit about about my textbook. And hopefully, it'll be useful to you. And hopefully, I'll get some some good feedback myself. So, as Jennifer said, I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So, I can't actually see any of you, but you can see me, obviously. And I think that we will be doing the questions through the through the comments. So if you have a question in the chat, uh, Jennifer, is, I've asked Jennifer to interrupt me, and I'd like to just take questions as they arise. And I'll also stop and see if anyone has any questions at various moments. So I've prepared a few a few slides. So let me get going on 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 that, and uh, that will give us some some place to start from. So. Here's a few things that I want to do. I'd like to start off by introducing the book. I'd like to talk for, in case any of you have used it or are interested in using it, about some of the things that are new in the third edition. And then I'd like to introduce the electronic resources, the online resources that I've set up to, to, to accompany the book and the website that I'll, I'll walk you through the website that I've set up. If there's anybody here who's used the book, I'd be really interested in hearing what's worked well, what's worked less well, or if you haven't used it but using another book, I'd be interested to hear what you think is good or not so good about that other book. And I've been, a, we've all suddenly found ourselves teaching online of necessity, but I've been teaching online for, for a few years now, and I'm a, a pretty big enthusiast for an online teaching, and I teach and have taught for a while a fully online asynchronous logic course. That means there's no scheduled classes. It's all, it's all, um, it's all done at self-paced learning online. And I'd like to talk you through a little bit of that and hopefully have a more general discussion about teaching cognitive science and, and teaching online. And one thing that would be super for me would be to get some ideas and suggestions about the, uh, that, that I could use for the, for the fourth edition. So, Here's my book, it came out in 2010, Cognitive Science and Introduction to the Science of the Mind. I did a second edition in 2014 and a third edition came out uh, earlier, earlier this year. The basic, like most people, I wrote a textbook because I wasn't very happy with the materials that, that were out there and I wanted to do something that would fit sort of my vision of how, how the subject should be taught. And in particular, I was looking for a textbook that wasn't written by a committee. Books in cognitive science are quite often written by groups of people. So you, you get someone to write a chapter on neuroscience, someone to write a chapter on cognitive science, someone to write a chapter on philosophy and linguistics and so on. And then someone, someone who draws the short straw gets to write a chapter explaining what the possible connections between these things might be. But I didn't want to, I didn't want that way of approaching the subject because I was looking for something that presented cognitive science as an interdisciplinary enterprise, something that pulls disciplines together and creates something that's greater than the sum of its parts, not something that um, juxtaposes different and independent enterprises. And I also was, was keen to have a textbook that recognized the fact that when we think about the mind, we do so in increasingly in the context of thinking about the brain. And so the, the neurosciences, and there are many different types of neuroscience, are at the center of cognitive science, and I wanted them to be pretty central in my, in my textbook. So those were the things that, that sort of inspired me back in, in 2010, or when I started writing this, which was a few years before that. And 
you know, some people have been using this book. It's used in America and Canada, various places in Europe, China, and so on. If there's anyone out there who's using the book and you're not on this map, drop me a line or say something in the comments and I'll I'll update my map. And then so you can see from this map, if you're in if you're in the United States of America, this is a politically neutral textbook. We uh, have readership from red states, blue states, and uh, everywhere in between. So a few comments on the uh, on the on the third edition. One of the feedback that I had from the first and second editions was that the book was a little challenging. And I think that's quite often something that the that, that textbook authors find that, you know, it's hard to find that pitch, find the right pitch to to say something that's interesting and hopefully original, but also to pitch it at the right level for students. So I made a major stylistic overhaul to improve accessibility. I simplified the, simplified the language, got rid of some of the sort of more complex ways that I was setting things up. And in particular, I, I got rid of the, the basic organizational structure that I had in the first two editions centered around something that I call the, the integration challenge. Anyway, the, 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 the bottom line is that I reorganized the book to allow it to be used more accessibly for students and to, to be used more flexibly in, in individual courses. And updated, of course, the, the text and the references. Cognitive science is, the other, the other thing I teach a lot is logic. Logic is, one of the great things about logic is basically, you know, we're kind of all set with, with logic up to a certain level. Nothing's gonna change much. It's just the laws of thought, and they're not changing at all. Cognitive science is more of an evolving discipline. So in the 10 years since the first edition, a lot's happened. So I've updated the text and the references all the way through. I added a new chapter on deep learning. I, to be honest with you, when I was writing this book in 2008, 2009, I didn't think I'd even heard of deep learning. But now it's, uh, it's clearly incredibly important in, in cognitive science and in, in everyday life. And in 2008, I'd certainly heard of Bayesian approaches to cognitive science, but they weren't really as, as important then as they are now. So I've added a chapter on Bayesianism in cognitive science and um, added new materials on Bayesian approaches to, to language learning. And then finally, I've always been keen on, on having online resources to use with the to use with this textbook. And I made a complete reboot helped by, by one of my graduate students of all of those, of all of those resources. So let, let me get out of this PowerPoint slide and um, hopefully you can see me again now. And um, let me just stop and see if anyone's got any, any questions so far. Jennifer, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, we did have a few questions that we received before this webinar. Uh, so I will read them out loud. So our first question was, students are hit hard financially during the current pandemic and the loss of part-time jobs. Textbooks tend to be very expensive and many students use copies bought by libraries. In the current environment, libraries are restricting access or stopping lending books. How can we support students getting access to these books at a financially viable rate? Well, I think, so I think that's a really important that's a really important issue. And at my own university, about twenty five percent of Texas A and M University, we have sixty five thousand students. It's one of the largest universities in America. About twenty five percent of our students are first generation in college. We have a high uh, percentage of students that that receive Pell grants. That is, their it's an indicator of 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 economic. A certain level of economic difficulty. So I'm very sensitive to to student financial concerns, and I'm happy to say that from that perspective, I think that really a lot of the I think that Cambridge University Press is a pretty good publisher at pricing textbooks, and I think that from an instructor's point of view, what we should be doing as instructors is 
paying attention to identifying finding texts that are that are um, that are reasonably priced. And when I looked around at texts for my logic course, for example, I see some of the some of the commercial textbook publishers who will remain nameless, but you know who they are. Uh, charging books at $150 or $200 for, for what, quite frankly, is a mediocre textbook. So I think that the pricing at the publisher level is, is really important. And I noticed that a lot of um, presses, and again, CUP is doing this, are developing Cambridge Core or Oxford Scholarship Online, where um, students can access online versions of text through, through their libraries. And I think that's a really important in, initiative as well. But if I could just give 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 a little plug for CUP pricing on my book, it's it's sixty dollars for um, four hundred eighty eight pages, full full color. You know, I'd love it if they charged ten times the price, but I'm I'm proud that it's a, that it's a, available for sixty dollars a, a copy, and I think that's a that's a good price for an, for an academic textbook. And it's the only thing students need to buy. Great. And we did have another question um, from that same individual. So textbooks tend to be static due to their format and focused on an individual learner. Discussion is often achieved through class activities. The current pandemic measures restrict uh, opportunities for, for class activities, highlighting the need to develop more creative interactive solutions for students to interact with each other. How can a traditional textbook help students become more interactive and facil facilitate discussion with peers and instructors during this pandemic? So I think I think that's a really part of, of, of lots of things about how how textbooks need to evolve, not just because of the pandemic, but because, you know, we've been kind of out of date in our teaching methods for for, for a long period of time. So I think that's I'm going to take that as a segue to to talking about the the online resources that I've developed for this textbook, because I think that they go, one of, one of the ideas that I was trying to, to promote was to find ways of getting students to engage more creatively with the, with the material and giving, giving um, instructors the resources to, to do that. So if I could just share an, a different screen and go to the uh, course website. Have you got that, Jennifer? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So, um, so I set up this this website. You can access it through the uh, CUP website or go directly to the imaginatively, na imaginatively named BermudezCogside.com. And I I created these resources to try and help instructors be sort of more. Give them the give them the tools to to get their students to engage in a more dynamic way with the text. So there are some resources that are open to everyone, including students, and there are some resources that are specific to instructors. So let me just talk a little bit about the 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 things that are open to everyone. So there's for each chapter in the book, I've working with one of my graduate students worked out a, a sort of set of online online resources and links to, for example, experimental demonstrations or relevant papers or things that are discussed in the in in the text. And they've been curated so that I think I would have confidence about sending sending students to them. I'm not sure if I can let me see if I can share that. I think that's probably coming up in a in a new page. But uh, let me go back here and try sharing it again. No. Yes. Okay, I guess I, I will just, just do this the old fashioned way and just, just describe to you that, so for example, chapter one is one of the historical chapters. So I discuss a, a range of, of articles from the early history of cognitive science and students in given links to, to experimental reconstructions of classical experiments or to the original papers, to um, relevant, relevant resources that other people have developed to, you know, to help students understand behaviorism and elements of 
Turing machines and basic concepts in, in cognitive science. And of course they can do that individually or they can do that in groups. And I think it would be kind of a cool project to, you know, if you had a class of, of uh, 50 students to divide them up into eight, eight or 10 groups and get each group to, to explore some subset of, of resources and report back to the, to the main class. And again, you can do that in a classroom. You can do it online using, uh, using Zoom. And I've also constructed some discussion questions for each of the, uh, for each of the chapters that, again, students could use in, 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 small, in small groups to, to work together to try and deepen their understanding of the material. We have a question. Um, so Sylvia is asking, interaction between the students at the moment is limited, even if we have online tools. Uh, do you have any advice? Well, so I'm going to talk about this in, 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 in a little bit because um, I want to say a little bit about the online logic course that I've been teaching. And actually, st student interaction between students can be, can be promoted, I think, using the, using the tools that we've got. So, for example, if you're using a learning management system such as Blackboard or, or Canvas, that has... Uh, that has discussion boards that built into it. So you can divide students into little learning groups and their group will have um, a discussion. And I do that in my course. And I find that they also tend to develop, um, let me stop sharing my screen so that you can see, so they stop. What I find is that students work together outside those formal discussion groups as well. They set up group me's and they text each other and have WhatsApp and stuff like that. So I think that, you know, I think, the, the tools are there and there are other proprietary tools like Packback, for example, which is a software mechanism that encourages students to question, to, to, to design questions and answer each other's questions with, with respect to, um, with respect to reading that you assign. So I think, I think there is stuff there. And as instructors, I think we need to think about how to, how to make use of it and also how to exploit the fact that, you know, the, the, the current generation of students is pretty attuned to to interacting in an online format. They were doing that even when they were able to to coexist in 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 classrooms in a way that they're not at the moment. So hopefully that that helps you with that. And I want to talk a little bit more about the about about my course, and I'll take you through the the Blackboard site and stuff like that in a in a little bit. But let me just go back to these to these web resources. Great question. So keep keep them coming. Go back to this uh, and share this website again, because I also set up for a bunch of things for instructors to use. So the the textbook has has in it um, integrated into the chapter, not at the end of each chapter, but actually as you go through it, exercises and that students can do a different ranges of of difficulty, and to help the instructors, I've given solutions and hints to all the in-chapter exercises. This, this bit of it, this bit of the website is obviously password protected. There are about 140 illustrations, full color illustrations in the book. I've put PowerPoint slides on here. So again, those can be shared with students. And I've also designed review questions that can be, that can be given to students. And I've designed them in a way that they can be instantly uploaded into learning management systems like Blackboard directly, or they can be um, uploaded to Respondus, which then interacts with different learning management systems. So if you use Moodle or Canvas, then you can upload into Respondus and your university will probably have Respondus. And then it goes straight directly from Respondus into whatever the, the LMS is. And I've also done test bank questions. So the review questions are for students to use really to test their own learning. So that's something that they would do in their own time. And then the test bank questions are designed for instructors to, um, to develop quizzes and to, um, to, to assess learning. So these are kind of, the student review questions are kind of um, formative and the test bank questions are summative. I believe that's the, 
that's the technical terminology. So that's the that's the website. And let me stop and see if anyone anyone else has has some questions. Yes, uh, there was another question. Um, what is the solution to reduce the higher education delay and adaptation process in this lockdown situation? I know it's a little similar to the other questions, but um, if you have any other perspectives. The, sorry, the, to the, the adaptation of what to what? Uh, ad adaptation to remote teaching. Oh, the adaptation to remote teaching. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that in the in the next section in the context of my online logic course and sharing some of my experiences about on online teaching. the The problem is that I think as a, as many people have figured out, online teaching is not that easy. <laughs> are, there, are there some other questions that I could maybe tackle before before getting on to them? Uh, at the moment, no. All right, awesome. So. sure that I've talked about that yeah so let me say first why let me put a positive spin on it because I think that for many people a lot of people have a lot of negative thoughts about online teaching and I keep reading stuff on the higher education websites and so on and people are saying well look this is just an evil administrators are going to use the pandemic as a way to force us all to teach online and it's going to be disastrous for students because everyone knows that online teaching is not as good as real teaching and actually uh, I don't agree with that and I think there's no evidence for it and there's plenty of evidence that online teaching when it's properly done can be um, can be can be really beneficial to students. So I want to start off just by saying a little bit about why I'm a why I'm a huge fan. And one reason I think is that it allows students to work at their own pace. And I think this is an experience that that you must have had the experience if you teach large classes of say 150 students in a class that you're trying to talk to the students and you can see that a significant proportion of them are a way ahead of you and find what you say kind of irritating and a significant another significant proportion are uh, way behind you and desperately struggling to catch up and really you're talking to a relatively small percentage of the students which are the ones in the middle and you have to make that decision do you go super slowly to scoop up the ones that are falling behind you go super fast to stimulate the people ahead of you or do you just sort of chug along in the middle and and really make a lot of people unhappy and I think that's unavoidable in a typical large classroom context and I think one of the great things about online teaching is that students can work through the material at their own at their own pace and if they need to they can go over you know there's no way you can a student can rerun the lecture but if you've prepared a bunch of eight minute videos they can go back over the eight minute video that you've develop for the concept that they are struggling with. And I think it it's useful, online teaching can be useful because it imposes a lot of discipline. You can't run an online course and decide what you're going to talk about when you turn the when you turn the door handle on your way into the, the, the classroom in a way that you know many of us have done in 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 the past. I think being forced to to being forced to do stuff online forces you to think about what you're look, trying to achieve over a long-term period, over a whole semester, and how you're going to get there, and what is being done at each uh, each stage in the process. And I also really like online teaching because it allows me to spend more time with students. I've just finished teaching a, a summer session of, on my logic class. I didn't teach in the spring, but I teach. I prefer to teach in the summer. And I have 155, or started with 180, but not everyone could take the pace. I had 150 students, and I was able to deal personally with all of the problems that they had about logic. I spent a lot of time Zooming with them. They sent me screenshots of proofs, and I would just send them back hints. And that's stuff that I really am not able to do in a in a face-to-face -face class. So because I've I'm not spending time delivering material. I can spend much more time individually with with students. 
and I have a graduate student to help me, but the graduate student's job is to enter grades. His job is not to deal with student problems. I'm a great believer that students' problems should be dealt with by people who've got more experience than graduate students. So I think that there are some massive advantages to online teaching, but there are also some massive disadvantages. And these are not pedagogical ones, they're practical ones. I mean, the, the major problem is that it's just a, a huge upfront investment in, in, in time and effort. When I, did, when I prepared my logic course, and it's, it's a process, it's still going on, I scripted every, every lecture, I wrote it all out and read it out and then edited the tapes. And that took, a, that took a long time. And you have to design a learning pathway that's going to work for students that, because you can't, you're not there to fill in the gaps. I think that what people sometimes fail to realize is how much of, how much, how many things are taken care of just, just in the run of the mill interaction in a classroom. You can answer questions, you can make um, adjustments on the fly. You can change your course. You're not supposed to, but you can change your course if you think the students are not following. You can't do any of that in an online course. So you've got to have thought it through much more carefully at the upfront. And you have to answer all the, all the questions that students might have in the materials that you prepare for them. Otherwise, you're going to spend your whole life answering, replying to emails with the words it's in the, you know, explaining stuff that, that, you, should have, that you should have written down. So I want to illustrate just just what 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 has worked for me, and this is just very personal. So we did have one more question. Yeah. So how does cognitive science differ from other similar textbooks? From so I think great question. Um, I think that the main thing that I would point to if someone, if, 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 I, if I was asked about that, as I just have been, would be the, that I've tried to write it as, as, an, as a textbook to an interdisciplinary area. It's not a review of key concepts. So I, it's a book entitled Cognitive Science, not The Cognitive Science. So I haven't given you an introduction to basic concepts of psychology, basic concepts of neuroscience, basic concepts of linguistics. I've tried to explain why we need to have this thing called cognitive science that does a job that none of those things do, do on their own. So I've tried to make the book uh, integrative and picking out why we need to have this new, well, it's not new anymore, but why we need to have a, a distinctive area of inquiry that's not a... Um, a collage of 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 things that are already already out there. We have a follow up question. So, uh, so is cognitive science more for undergraduates or graduate students? So I think I think it's for both. I mean, I when I was originally putting the book together, um, I I was wrote it for an. I, I wrote it for an introductory class to a, a degree program in philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology at Washington University in St. Louis. And I, but I've also looked to see who's using it and got feedback from users of the first edition and the second edition. And it's been used in in graduate classes as well. You just, it's used in a different way. So for the undergraduate classes, people would typically move more slowly do all the exercises for graduate classes it would be used more as a, as a sort of springboard so giving the framework and then you can assign more advanced readings that will that will give you the that will give students the deeper kind of approach that would be more appropriate for graduate students and you can do that with the um you know with the the the, the, the online resources will help to provide those supplementary those supplementary uh identify those supplementary readings. I wish I could see the people so I could get some sense of whether that's a satisfactory answer, but I guess if it's not, then then um, follow up. Oh, okay, so so I see, I'm seeing another follow-up question from Rebecca. So 
you spoke about online teaching being beneficial. Do you think this experience will change how courses are taught and encourage more experimentation? Yes, I hope so. I th but I, and I think it will. Um, so as a as a sort of proselytizer for online for online teaching, I talked to quite a few of my colleagues about how they can, um, you know, how they can. How, how to deal with the transition to online. And what I've noticed is that a lot of people are thinking, well, maybe if I, you know, if I start to record some good videos, I use Camtasia, I don't just uh, put up an, an, a Zoom, a, a recording of a Zoom call, I can do something creative and then that will free up time for discussion. I've noticed also people using software like Packback and generally, you know, I think, uh, speaking for myself, I mean, uh, and I was a bit jaded until I started the online teaching. And now I'm thinking much more imaginatively and creatively about how to engage students. And I think that's a, that's a widespread phenomenon. I think, it's an, I think it's a good thing. And on that note, let me go back to the, so let me just talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the course that I put together. Um, I think I've got the, okay. Yeah, sorry, I was just about to break some FERPA requirement by flashing up the grade center because the last thing I was doing was entering grades before you, before I, I came on. So, so can you, Jennifer, can you see the screen that I've shared? Yes, I can. Okay, so so I mentioned that that you know there's a major upfront investment and that you need to design a clear learning pathway, and here's you know here are the results of the major upfront investment that I made. So. So my course is divided up into a bunch of modules. Now, I mean, the content is probably of no interest to you whatsoever, but let me just uh, look at, talk you through it from the perspective of, of a student. So these are students who, they don't see me unless they email me or they set up a Zoom conversation. They, uh, you know, they start at module one and they, they work all the way through doing the assignments in each, in each module when they finished each module they go on to the to the next one. And I'll talk about how the timetabling works. But so here's a typical a typical module. So the students come in, there's a study guide. The uh, study guide gives a brief overview of the module. It tells you what they're and tells them what they're going to learn, tells them what the videos are. I can tell you already that that video 5.1 is too long at 17 minutes, 20, 17 minutes, 29 seconds. I really think that 10 minutes is, is, a, is an upper bound for an, for attention span. It tells them what they're supposed to read and tells them what the, uh, what the assignments are. So after the students have been doing this for a while, they just go straight to the study guide. They see what, how this is going to count towards their final grade. They do the reading. They do the exercises, they do the assignments. Assignments are all submitted online to an online proof checker, and the proof checker gives them gives them feedback on their on their exercises. So I mentioned that just simply to to sort of emphasize this idea that that um, that that it's a lot of work to design a clear learning pathway that a student can 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 just follow the follow the path without having the guidance of in 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 person of an in person in person classroom and in addition to in addition to designing a clear learning pathway you need to have a community and and a sense of, and and a contact i mean online doesn't mean contactless it's just a different kind of a different kind of contact so my students are divided up into into little discussion groups and they're encouraged by with various uh, icebreaker assignments to 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 reach out to the other people in their in their in their discussion group and and as i mentioned the evidence is that they do that and they you know they set up group me's and then they start sharing information not sharing solutions but sharing sharing information sharing insights and then i make myself super available for, for, for students. My, my view is if I'm not delivering classroom material, I compensate for that by, by basically replying to emails pretty much as soon as I get them. And this is kind of a little bit intense when I'm running an, in, an intensive summer session because it's only five weeks long 
and they have assignments due every day of the week. And the assignments are always due at 11.59 p.m. So I answer a lot of emails late in the evening as students get back from work and get onto this. But that's all right. That's that's fine. It frees up the mornings. And then I'm available for, for Zoom comments. And I think that Zoom, Zoom is great because it allows you to share a screen in a much more interactive way than we're doing now. So I use software with these students and they do their proofs on software. They share their they share their screen, they work through the proof, I give them hints, help them, and it's a really efficient way of of, of solving their solving their problems. And one other thing I did want to mention on this subject is keeping students on track. So let me get out of here. So they have 26 modules. And the problem with logic is it's kind of builds on itself. So, you know, you if you get behind, you're never going to catch up. So I have about a hundred assignments that they do in each course. Some of them, you know, not all of these are super difficult, some of them are little quizzes. But there's a pretty rigid timetable. And each assignment has a recommended date and a due date. And if the day, if the student hasn't completed it by the recommended date, then they get an email saying, hey, you haven't finished this assignment. Uh, and the due date is that's usually tomorrow in, in this summer session. So they have no, you know, they they're constantly, they're constantly have the have the reminder of the of the structure and of the structure of the course. And it keeps them on track. And they find the emails really irritating and that's fine because then the way to make the emails go away is to do the stuff by the recommended completion date and then they'll also be more successful more successful in the course and again if you use blackboard or or a similar learning management system then then the students will automatically get reminders of assignment so this is just yet another layer of of reminder and i think my experience of online teaching is that you really need redundancy is a really good thing so you can't assume that just giving one piece of information on one occasion is sufficient you need to find multiple different ways of presenting the same the same information uh yeah and let me stop see if anyone's got any questions about online teaching i'm surprised that no one has sort of torn into me on my saying that online teaching can be beneficial rather than the end of the universe Nothing at the moment, Jennifer? Uh, no, not at the moment. All right, awesome. So a final thing I did want to talk about was um, how to test students and how to run exams in an online format. Because this is, this, is, this is a real, this is a problem, but it's a problem that I think has a number of, has a number of solutions. So I used to use a, a an online proctoring service called Examity, which is kind of expensive, but it was neat. So one thing about online teaching is that you can't, you don't have any time. So you can't say the exam has to be taken on Monday from four to six. You have to give students like a 12 hour window to take the take the exam. And then you've got to deal with, with issues of, of, of academic integrity. So I used to do and use an online, well, first, I design tests that, so that no student will ever receive the same test. So the midterm exam for my course, there are, each question is from a, a, a pool of 10 questions. So there are 10 to the power of 14 possible different exams out there. So no amount of consultation is going to, is going to help. It's a huge upfront cost because you have to design 10 questions of roughly comparable difficulty testing the same, the same, the same thing. But once you've done that, it runs pretty smoothly. And then you need to find a way that the students can take the exam without being tempted to do anything that compromises academic integrity. So I used to use this online proctoring service called Examity, and they would dial into a, a website and there'd be a proctor at the end of it, typically located in, um, in Southeast Asia. And the proctor would go through there, identify them, and give them the instructions for the exam, and review the their environment through the webcam in the in the in their computer screen, and so on. 
and then they take the exam with the you know with the with their with with them, with them being recorded while they were while they were taking the exam through the webcam and the, and the 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 program also shuts down access to any other web browsers so it's kind of it's kind of a cool thing but the problem is that once the virus came then all the uh, remote proctoring centers closed down because they had all these people in close proximity in in mumbai or wherever so i use now an, an online solution called uh, respondus monitor which is the same thing except it's un except it's automated and uses uh, neural network software it's kind of relevant to the cognitive science theme so basically the students log in in the same way they do an environment check they're expected to do this they rotate their webcam around so that you can see their whole working environment and then when they take the test they're recorded and there's software that um, basically tracks the uses facial recognition to to track their their movements and then it flags if there's suspicious behavior so for example if I'm in the middle of my test and I suddenly turn around and start talking to someone behind me, that gets flagged by the software. And then I, as the instructor, can go in and review that specific section of the video and decide whether, you know, it was somebody's mother coming in with a cup of tea or whether it was someone coming in with, with uh, answers to the probability questions. So I find that works, that works pretty well. The combination of having super complicated exams that you never have the same one twice and then having this um, online, online, um, online proctoring, proctoring solution. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the that's the final piece of the of the online teaching. I don't know whether that's hopefully that's helpful to some people. It took me a while to figure it all out, and I was kind of concerned that I was going to have to stop my course when the proctoring centres all closed down. But it turns out that there's a pretty good solution out there and your university may well have access to to lockdown browser. Jennifer, is there anything is there anything out there? Um, at the moment, pretty much, my, yeah. pretty much at the, the end of the things that I wanted to say, I may have got rid of my audience, but uh, at the moment, no, we don't have any more questions. Um, I thought that was a really good discussion and overview of everything. Well, give people a couple of minutes if there's anyone out there who wants to ask a question or encourage people if you have a thought or a question afterwards to contact me by email. I'm not very hard to find. Just Google my name at Texas A&M University and it'll probably come up with an email address pretty quickly. Always happy to hear from people and always happy to talk about online teaching. I put a lot of thought into it and I'm always happy to share my experiences or get insights from other people. Yep, and if anyone else has any questions after this webinar, please feel free to email us at higherededucation at cambridge.org, and we'll forward it on to Jose as well. Oh, here's a question. If they've not had the opportunity, if so, if instructors have not had the opportunity to create their own resources along with your own website, are there any key areas that they can look at online? Well, I think it depends on the I think it depends on the on the areas. I mean, I know that there are a couple of online logic courses. I just don't think that they're they're very good. I'm not familiar with online cognitive science courses. My my recommendation, if you are so backpedaling a little bit, so that that course that I've shown you, that logic course, I ran it, I ran it as a pilot. And then I ran it three more times before now. And each time I made some pretty substantial changes. And the reason I mention that is because it takes it takes a long time to do to get this sort of stuff to a satisfactory level. So my recommendation, if you if you find yourself in the position of suddenly having to to prepare an online course, would be not to try to do something that is completely self-contained, completely asynchronous, but to start flipping bits of your course and by that i mean where you would normally give a lecture and then maybe have a discussion section record the the stuff from the lecture and then integrate some online exercises and perhaps draw in some other material you can link there's no law that says you can't link to stuff on youtube and there's helpful stuff on on youtube or if you uh, 
discriminating in what you what you what you use. So I would I would my recommendation would be a kind of bootstrapping strategy, and as you reiterate the course, just um, flip more and more stuff and integrate more and more more things. As I've talked to people who who tried to to do the online thing from 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 scratch, create a completely self contained course, and and just gave up. It, too much to do, if, especially if you're time constrained and it's the beginning of July and semester starts in six weeks time, seven weeks time. Yeah, good luck. So the question, do you have any final advice for instructors on keeping up their own engagement at, at, at this hard time? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. <laughs> it's kind of, it's hard not to get a little bit demoralized. I mean, all of the things that we normally do, like go to conferences, are are, are not happening. But a chunk of that stuff can be recreated online. I mean, I've found myself involved in in a lot of Zoom discussion groups. In some ways, it's easier. You know, it's a hassle to get someone to come and give you a talk in the department. It's a hassle to go and give a talk in someone else's department. It takes two days out of your life for traveling and stuff like that. It's much easier to to invite someone to come in and talk for for an hour and a half, or to go and talk to people, or have a little discussion group, a reading group. I mean, all those sorts of things you can do from the you know from the isolation of your of your healthy healthy environment. You know, I think sometimes there are some positives. There, I think there are some positives here that that it's important to to pick up on, and. I mean, I know that the you know when I get a bit dispirited, I think that that I have it a lot easier than many of my students who are trying to work and trying to work in environments where people are not respecting their public health obligations and you know where they have no option about what they're going to do and they're dealing with unpleasant, rude people and then they go home to a crowded house and I think that my life is a lot easier than that so sometimes it's, I find it helpful to reflect on some of the, <laughs> some of the difficulties that some of our students are having great thank you we do have one last question um, do you think it is possible to meaningfully develop several online courses simultaneously in a situation such as we were in March I think yeah I mean I I was Fortunate. I mean, I don't know whether it's fortunate or not, but I happen to have to have been on leave in March when all this was happening. So that kind of freed me up to to help other people and share some of my own experiences, but also meant that I wasn't simultaneously preparing multiple online courses. So I think, I mean, I think it's really hard. And and the best advice that I've got is 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 kind of the advice I've already given is to do things incrementally. And bear in mind that that your students are going to cut you some slack, and especially they will cut you slack if you make if you make yourself available outside outside of the official classroom context, and make it clear that you don't see the online format as one that that is impersonal in any in any shape or form. And I think another thing to remember is that students themselves at, at the moment are are often pretty isolated. I mean, that's alarmingly large numbers of my class of 150 students are in quarantine or already virused up in, in one form or another. Yeah, okay, well, thanks very much. I've really enjoyed uh, talking on uh, great, some great questions and some great discussions. So. Um, Hopefully that's given you some things to think about and certainly given me some things to think about. So thanks again to Jennifer and the and the folks at CUP for, for organizing this.